Right. So hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar, Designing a Programming Language for Early Learners. Um, my name is Dylan. Um, this is Anthony. Colleague. We're both from Wonder Workshop. We'll tell you a little bit about uh, who we are and what the company is. But first, um, let's start off by just doing a little bit of housekeeping for uh, EdWeb. To get your CE certificate for this Ed webinar, if you're an EdWeb member, your personalized certificate will be posted to your homepage by the end of the next business day. If you logged in with your email address, we'll email you links to a CE certificate form, the recording, and how to get added resources. And this is important. You only need to take the CE quiz if you dialed in by phone, are watching as a group, or are viewing this as a recording. So folks that are already here, um, not a problem. And you can join the EdWeb, uh, join EdWeb to get personalized CE, cert CE certificates to access the archives. Um, finally, a um, lot of fun things happening, a lot of really interesting webinars and great folks to engage with in the coding and robotics K-8 community on EdWeb. It's www.edweb.net slash code, where you'll find recordings, chat logs, quizzes, online discussions, and lots of resources there. So thanks to the EdWeb folks for having us, um, and we'll get started with the webinar. Excellent. So first, your online facilitators. So a quick, quick back background on us. Um, my name is Dylan Porterlance. I'm the product manager at Wonder Workshop. Um, we'll tell you a little bit more about Wonder Workshop, but in short, we create uh, robots that are used in K through eight education for learning, coding, and of course, robotics, um, as well as several other subjects that we um, have cross curricular lessons for. Um, in my role, I primarily work with um, our customer base, so teachers, administrators, um, and students that are using our robots in their classroom. Um, and as well as work with our engineering and design team here at, uh, at our San Mateo headquarters in the Bay Area um, to figure out what the next features are that we need for our robots and our software. Exactly. Uh, and I'm Anthony Fudd. Uh, I'm a senior product manager here at Wonder Workshop. Uh, and so my duties here involve a lot of research into new products, sometimes designing new products, sometimes working with the engineering teams uh, to create work on uh, software and, and uh, product design, and then ushering that product through uh, till we get to the market. And we have another online facilitator in the room named Dash. Um, Dash can go ahead and uh, introduce himself. <laughs> As you can see, the little blue robot um, in the top right of the screen, or maybe it's not the top right for you, but you should be able to differentiate the humans from the robot, hopefully. <laughs> um, so that's Dash. That's one of our products that we create at Wonder Workshop. I'll go to the next slide, actually. Uh, Wonder Workshop was founded in uh, 2013. Our first products on the market were these blue robots, Dash and Dot. Who's familiar with Dash and Dot? Anybody using Dash and Dot out there? in their classrooms or even at home. Anybody familiar or using hey. our robots? Hey, all the hey, time, someone lot. said, awesome. Yeah. A few yeses, okay. okay. New yeah. How many folks yeah. have never heard of Wonder Workshop or Dash and Dot? Any folks who have never heard, willing to, that's a, that's okay, a good answer. Okay, that's good. Maybe a future. All right, someone just got their kit last week. Okay. Cool. I love Dash, says Natalia yeah. from Maryland. Thanks so much. a Swift user as well. A Swift Playgrounds user. Interesting. Nope, never heard of it. Sorry. Oh, don't apologize. That's okay. Hey, I'm that's glad that you were able to join us anyway and listen to us talk. Okay. So the topic of this webinar is designing a programming language for early learners. And we're going to talk about several different things regarding programming languages and design of programming languages. Um, but one of the reasons that this is particularly important to us is because we actually, at Wonder Workshop, um, for our robots, design programming languages for, for early learners. Not just early learners, um, but we have several apps um, that provide a way for young children to actually code and engage with computational thinking as they're programming robots and creating activities and all kinds of different things for themselves using our, our ecosystem. So, first of all, we'd like to know where are you, not just where are you joining us from, because a lot of you have already sounded off in the chat, but what is your role in education? Are you a teacher? Are you an administrator? Are you um, a technology specialist? Are you someone that works in education but outside of, of schools and classrooms? Are you a student? Maybe, maybe you're back in school right now and getting your degree in education. Uh, I see librarians, yeah. okay. Iowa K through 12 ELL. Gifted and talented specialist, okay. A paraprofessional, STEM yeah. specialist. Really a lot of diversity here. A lot of different kinds of, of educators, paraprofessionals. Technology teachers, another librarian. Montessori teacher, global teacher. Work from home in Miami, but my students are in Spain and Argentina. That's fascinating. Yeah, some entrepreneurs in the group. Awesome. Okay. Anybody working at an education technology company? 
Me, <laughs> Carol from Pennsylvania. Very interesting. Uh, public library, preschool teacher, Oklahoma and third grade teacher. Okay. And thanks for adding questions. We see in the top right of our screen that you're adding questions. So we'll get to those kind of towards the end. Um, the chat flies by pretty quickly, so you can imagine it's it's difficult to answer all the questions right away, but I'll, we'll try our best at the end. Okay, software developer, okay. Yeah. Volunteer, former head coach of USA pre-college something. Kindergarten I I teachers. It. Rails developer. Okay, fascinating. Thanks so much for sharing your role in education. It's really cool to see all the different types of folks that are out there um, and how this might be relevant to them. So what we're going to talk about today in terms of designing a programming language First of all, the why. Why would someone want to teach about programming language design? And why might you be here um, to learn about that? Why might students care? Why might teachers care? We'll get into what is a programming language. What is the definition of that? And how, how, what particular aspects of that definition might be relevant for you to think about and ponder with your students um, through different activities? We'll talk about some programming language design examples. So we'll actually look at some programming languages throughout history and think about what were some of the design principles that were used um, to create those programming languages, as well as um, how did that actually turn out and were they successful? Um, what were their legacies? And then um, our favorite part, we'll actually talk about the design of a programming language that we created here at Wonder Workshop for young kids to be able to program dash and dot. Um, that's called Wonder, and it's designed basically as a, as a state machine programming language. We'll talk about that. Um, towards the end, but first let's dive into kind of the why. So why why design of programming languages? Actually, a lot of people that I've talked to um, in the field didn't even didn't even think about this. Where they said, "Oh, I think my students may take for granted that programming languages are designed by actual humans." But why might this be important to talk about with your students or uh, with with other teachers, even and other educators? So first of all, the CSTA standards. One of them is actually evaluating existing technological functionalities and incorporating them into new designs. That's a mouthful, but essentially what that means is being able to pick different pieces of software um, and put them together to solve problems. But what that can also mean um, in terms of technological functionality or really just tools is being able to choose the right programming language. A lot of times people who are solving problems in a classroom or even in industry need to be able to make decisions about the trade-offs between different programming languages. What is, what is an advantage of using one programming language versus another to solve a problem? Maybe one of those trade-offs is time. Maybe it's, I already am familiar with this programming language and I can use it to my disposal. Maybe it's that certain uh, libraries are accessible. So for example, if you want to program a robot, maybe there's certain things that you want your robot to do with sound or with motion that certain programming languages um, have more readily available. There's many different trade-offs, and what CSTA is basically getting at is being able to evaluate those programming languages and understand those different trade-offs is something that's really important for students who are engaging with computational thinking. One other thing is that what talking about designing programming languages can do is provide a context that actually frames the learning of coding itself. So first of all, programming languages don't just pop out of nowhere and they don't just evolve on their own. A lot of times, most of the time, they're actually designed by humans. There's actual people who are sitting down and thinking, okay, I want to be able to make a computer do X, Y, or Z. What kind of, what kind of commands might I need? And if those commands don't exist at the time or if it's very difficult, they might actually sit down and create a new programming language. This is why programming languages are evolving because technology is constantly changing and the needs for how we might control a computer or control a device or a robot or, or anything else that's technological, those are constantly shifting too. So let's talk about what a programming language is. And I'd, I'd like to actually offer this question to you folks in the audience. What do you think a programming language is? And if you haven't, if you've, you know, joined the coding and robotics webinar or webinar community, uh, not knowing what a programming language is, you know, take your best guess. But I'd love to see in the chat, what is a programming language in your own words? Take a second to see if folks answer in the chat. A language that tells the computer to sequence steps, Sherry Silvio says from Pennsylvania. Cool, okay. 
So getting into this idea of sequencing. it has to be for a computer and maybe it has sequencing, learning a different language, how a person talks to a computer or a robot. Okay, so getting into the idea of a human using that language. A set of algorithms, says Priscilla from Pennsylvania. Instructions to make a computer or a device complete a task. Gwyneth McGuire from Maine says a process. Okay. Think for a second. What what is a programming language? Coding, Coding. says Elizabeth from Pennsylvania. Definitely. I think that, that word might be might be very key. Programming language executes specific functions and activities in sequential order. Vita says, my guess would be like a program that has a translation of language, so it's better understood to that person. Mm, interesting. So maybe not necessarily with a computer. All the rules of a regular language with syntax and grammar rules to communicate clearly to multiple files. Okay, so getting into kind of the technicality of what you might use a programming language to do on a computer. These are great yeah. answers. Thanks for sounding off. And you can continue, you know, thinking about this as we talk about our definition. And this is just one definition, not the end-all be-all, of course. So from our perspective, a programming language is a set of instructions, usually known as code, and I know someone alluded to that in the chat, that are designed for a human to write and a computer to understand in order to perform tasks. So there's a bunch of things to unpack here, but one of the things that we're going to really stress today as we're talking about different programming languages and how they were designed is not just the set of instructions, but the fact that at the end of the day, a lot of times, almost all of the time, a human is going to need to understand that language and use it to be able to program a computer or to program a robot or some other piece of technology. So as we go through these different programming language examples, we'll be talking about what were the different things that humans who were designing those languages were thinking about humans who needed to use them eventually, um, and what are those different trade-offs between those different languages. Here's a whole bunch of programming languages. Maybe you, maybe you knew this, but there's actually hundreds of programming languages, and for several decades, folks have been creating new ones, iterating on old ones, borrowing ideas from previously existing ones, or tearing down the ideas from past languages and creating potentially better ones. Oftentimes, there's a lot of opinions about which programming language is the best, and we can get into all kinds of heated debates on the internet. But how many of these programming languages are you familiar with? Which ones have you seen before, or have you heard of, or used in your classroom even to teach computer science or computational thinking? Let's see if folks in the chat can respond with the different programming languages that they might be familiar with. John Moran says, right. learning Python now, cool. Wonder what you're learning Python to do. Scratch, Snap Scratch. Scratch, okay. So we'll talk about Scratch a little bit today. Java, JavaScript, C++. Python. Java and Python. Blockly, cool. Blockly with our robots or a different Blockly? I studied basic in high school. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> C++. With the robots, great. How to use a computer. Scratch is it for me at the moment. That might be all you need. That's Gail Morris from Delaware. Okay. I recently downloaded an app called Grasshopper to learn how to code. Yeah, so there's a lot of different apps and many different programming languages that you can actually now learn on your phone um, just by downloading apps. Lego software. Okay, so yeah. Let's see, JavaScript. I learned coding on Fortran hey. and a sad face emoji. So we will actually talk about Fortran a little bit today and maybe you'll have less of a sad face, uh, Sue, um, once you, you hear us talk about why it was designed the way it was. Old school, Pascal. Okay, those are great answers. Thanks for, thanks for sounding off. Um, so by all means, these are not all of the different programming languages that are out there, but just to give you an idea of, you know, there's all these different languages and people are constantly trying to find better ones and think of better ways to program computers. So keeping that in mind. So here's an audience question before we actually start talking about uh, different case studies of programming languages and how they were designed. Um, and at the crux of it, a programming language is just a way to communicate, but it's a way to communicate from a human to a computer, um, occasionally from a computer to a computer. But there's other kinds of communication as well, and they have different trade-offs, different pros and cons, or advantages and disadvantages. So in the chat, I'd love to hear from you what about verbal language, written language, and emoji? What are some of the advantages and disadvantages of these different forms of human language? Human to human language. And maybe this is something that you might consider talking about with your students. Written language does not include tone and body language. Great, so thinking about that. 
Disadvantages, not all speak and understand the same languages. Very true. Millions and millions of people might not be able to communicate without having that same language. Generational language differences, interesting, emojis. Emojis shows more emotion than written language, that written language doesn't at all times. Thank you, Monica. Mm -hmm. Common understanding, what is soon? <laughs> that sounds a little bit loaded. Advantage, visual orientation. Verbal language is always more informative. With verbal language, you can adjust your speaking tone when necessary. Karen, how they spell different, definitely. So being able to spell is something that you might need to be able to do written language. Swati Gupta from New Jersey says, verbal, we can see facial expressions, which is not possible in written. So thanks for thinking about that. These are, these are the kinds of questions that we need to be thinking about for all kinds of different communication, not just programming languages. But this will hopefully get you started in terms of what to think about as you're evaluating these different ones. So let's actually dive into some of these particular ones. So I can't remember who it was, but someone on the chat said that they learned Fortran and actually put a sad face that they had to learn <laughs> Fortran. Um, we don't use Fortran as much nowadays. Um, it was created in 1957 by IBM, uh, which is you know still a very powerful company today. But one of the things that we wanted to talk about was if you look at Fortran, which is on the, the rightmost column out of these three, uh, it might seem intimidating and it might seem very abstract nowadays because many of our programming languages, and also if you're not familiar with programming, you might say, well, what is that? But if you look closely, you'll actually see some uh, English words like sum, do, punch, and dimension. And those, those are actually readable. And you know, before Fortran was created uh, by the designers at I IBM, there were actually people that were programming their computers in binary. They were learning how to command the computer to do the exact instructions that are on the right side of the screen here in binary. Um, then when Fortran came along, it became a lot easier not just to learn a programming language, um, but to actually be able to think about how, based on the way that you wanted to instruct the computer, what were the specific commands that you might need, and to be able to look those up and be able to use them very quickly. And it's actually funny, when, when Fortran was invented, a lot of the folks who had come up on binary and had kind of taught themselves binary, binary and thought about how to become great binary programmers, some people were actually very frustrated, and this is an interesting thing in programming language design history, that there was something easier now that allowed more people access, um, and it was actually designed with the intent of making that language accessible. The thing in the middle you'll actually see is kind of a stepping stone from binary to Fortran. It's, it's an assembly language, and basically that is a way to interpret that binary and actually write instructions that are a little bit more human readable, although you won't see English words. But what Fortran did was actually say, let's use words in English along with numbers and other, other symbols to be able to command a computer. Who's familiar with Logo? Anybody out there use Logo, whether in the 60s or in, in, all the way to the 90s, I think? Might have been the last time that I saw it being used. Anybody using Logo in a classroom or use Logo in a classroom? Or maybe that was their first experience using a programming language? Karen says no, okay, never, okay. Never. Not a lot of Logo users. Not a lot of Logo users, okay. So Logo was actually created in the 60s at the MIT Media Lab as a way to create a programming language for learning. Um, and it was probably the first programming language that was created explicitly for people to be able to understand how to use a computer to write instructions and, and learn computational thinking. Oh, we have one person who says they used it with four to six-year-olds in the 80s. Very cool, Dan, thanks for sharing that. So what you'll see on the screen is a program on the left side. And that program has a sequence of instructions that commands what's basically a turtle on the screen to leave a line in its path. So the, the turtle will move forward first, then it will turn right 90 degrees, then move forward again, turn right 90 degrees. And as it's moving forward and turning right 90 degrees over and over again, it actually creates a square. So it's moving about, I believe it's 50 pixels, and then turning right 90 degrees. And educators were able to teach, it seems like children even as young as four, as our friend in Texas alluded to, to be able to create all kinds of different patterns and drawings and expose themselves to the, command, the paradigmatic commands of programming languages very early on. Um, and this was also a way to explore some of the powerful ideas in computational thinking, such as 
being able to iterate and loop things. In other words, doing things multiple times and being able to write in an instruction to do something multiple times instead of writing something multiple times. Or this idea of being able to reuse code um, in the form of functions or in the form of libraries. Anybody heard of Python? Any Python users? I, I think I remember in the chat earlier, people were learning Python or teaching with Python. Heard of, never used. Okay. Okay. I see that someone just wrote some Python <laughs> in the chat. It might not execute, but I can recognize that from a mile away. Okay. Very cool. So Python was created around 1991. And one of the reasons we wanted to share Python is because this was a programming language that was designed with publicly stated principles about how working on fixing this. Thanks, thanks, John. Um, this, was a, this was a programming language that had publicly stated manifesto of how to write good, clean code. And it, it, had a, it was very important for the people who created and designed Python that it was an accessible language, at least as much as it could be, as well as a language that was very extensible. In other words, it could get the job done with what was, what was in the language, and then other people could add on to it later. So there's thousands of different libraries that people have created so that you can use Python to interact with hardware or use Python to do different mathematical equations and things like that. But we pulled out a few particular interesting ones that were in the design of Python. So one is explicit is better than implicit. In other words, there were many programming languages before Python, and that still exists today, actually, where sometimes when you write the command, it's not clear what exactly it's going to do because there's other things that are happening under the hood. So you might write a command, and one time it'll do something, and then another time it'll do something else. And to the folks who created Python, this was unacceptable, and they wanted to create a, a programming language where you always could be sure what was happening. Readability counts. So in other words, as we saw before with assembly language and even binary, and Fortran to some extent, um, it can be very hard to read a programming language if it's not designed with the intent of having it be human readable. So the folks at Python, one of the things they did was they actually stripped away some of the syntactical elements that we're used to seeing in programming language, like brackets and semicolons, and in favor of white space and regular colons. So making it a little bit more connected to what we're used to seeing in human written language. Another one is errors should never pass silently. This is a really interesting one. A lot of, excuse me, a lot of times when you're programming, uh, your program will crash, but you won't necessarily know why because there isn't an explicit message to you telling you what happened and what went wrong. So one of the things that was really important in the design of Python was that anytime something goes wrong, to actually have a way to show the person who's writing in that language what went wrong. Um, so in other words, not passing silently. And then finally, if the implementation is easy to explain, it may be a good idea. So this is a powerful sentiment, basically just saying, if we're able to write code that is self-explanatory, where you can read it and you can see what it does, that's probably the right way to write code. And a lot of times when you're learning how to code, you'll run into code that doesn't make any sense, not because it doesn't work, but because it's not organized in a fashion such that you can follow the logic and follow the pattern of thought by the programmer. So these are just some of the, the different things that are in the Python manifesto, and I encourage you to look up the other things because they can be um, kind of debated in terms of what the values are, or you can use them as a way to evaluate other programming languages that you might do in your classroom. These particular ones are used more for industry, but you can imagine different principles that you might have of not just great writing, but great programming. On the left side, we actually have a little activity. Maybe you can take a look at this code. And even if you aren't a programmer, do you think you can, based on some of the, some of the English language in that program, um, see what that program is doing? So there's kind of a loop that's taking place. There is asking the, the computer for input. It says, ask your question. And then there's a conditional that says, prompt and a whole bunch of answers. One answer is, it is certain. Another one is, outlook good. <laughs> and a third one is, you may rely on it. Magic eight ball, yeah. thank you, John. So, so don't worry if, if you don't know Python, um, but basically what I'm trying to show here is that there's, there's a way that in Python you can really structure your program so that you can see those different, those different parts of it. So you can kind of see at the bottom those three different answers that you might receive from a magic eight ball, and this code can be executed uh, to be able to simulate a magic eight ball. Another programming language 
uh, that was created in 2001 called Processing was actually created and designed for folks who were familiar with visual art and visual design. So this gets into the idea of being able to use different metaphors in your programming language. For example, one of the commands in processing is actually to put a canvas on the screen. And this is a very different way of thinking about programming. Usually the first thing that you would do is maybe output some text or some numbers from a calculation. But with processing, what you can actually do is create a canvas on the screen and then write instructions that actually draw different shapes, different colors, or different patterns. And then with one of the loops that's in the language, actually create a way to create animations. So using the canvas and using different frames and using different strokes and fill colors, you can actually create all kinds of different interesting interactive designs and animations like what you see on the screen here. And finally, Scratch. Who's familiar with Scratch? I saw a couple of folks in the chat earlier that were using Scratch in their classrooms or maybe got their feet wet programming with Scratch. That's a lot of Scratch users. Whole bunch of Scratch users. All right. So Scratch was created in about 2002. And one of the things that Scratch did differently is they had a design principle that they didn't want um, actually young people, it was designed for young people, to get stuck on creating programs that didn't execute. In other words, if you wrote the syntax wrong or if you wrote code that was wrong, a lot of times the computer would just say, hey, that doesn't work. So what they did is they created this new paradigm of programming called block-based coding. And probably you've seen block-based coding in Blockly or other Scratch-like interfaces. But block-based coding allows you to basically sequence these different commands one by one, and you can visually snap them together. So the program on the left side that you'll see is uh, when you click the green flag, the cat is going to say, hello world. Um, and then I believe it's going to move some distance. On the right side, uh, similarly, there's an icon-based block programming language where um, children as young as in kindergarten can actually snap together horizontally these different commands. And then when they hit the green flag, the different characters on the screen will execute them. So many different design principles that were used to achieve a programming language that was designed for young learners. So before we jump into talking about Wonder and the programming language that we've actually designed at Wonder Workshop for programming our robots, what do you think should be different about a programming language designed for young learners? And what should be the same? So thinking about you know, what your experience is in your classroom, whether you're teaching coding or you're thinking about teaching, excuse me, coding to your students, and also thinking about the different programming languages that we showed and the different design principles that went into creating them. What do you think should be different about a programming language designed for young learners and what should be the same? We've got Susan from Ohio says, less writing for younger students. Maybe blocks to connect, okay, mm -hmm. so taking off of the scratch. Carol from Pennsylvania says pictorial. Okay. Any other ideas? I like Snap, which is a colored block building program. Okay, okay. so a good design, having, having that color in there so you can differentiate things. More visuals and images for young learners. Less words. Good to see some action from written code. Okay, thanks Priscilla. Kathy from Texas. It shouldn't be slowed down by not knowing how to spell a lot of words. Okay, so mm -hmm. thinking about a way that we could leverage some technology we have now around spell check or autocorrect, maybe. Mm -hmm. Should transition to other coding as easily as students advance. Okay. Molly from Arizona, pictorial, color coded, more visuals, easy verbal directions. Okay, so these are a lot of really great ideas, and thank you for, for thinking about this question because it's a hard question. Um, a lot of folks think that programming languages are really for industry or for adults um, or for only certain students. And we actually take the opposite approach. We think that anybody can learn to code. And part of the challenge is a matter of not just designing the way that you teach students, but also how do you design the programming language itself? So I'll let Anthony tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about uh, our programming language called Wonder and how it's used to program the robots. Yeah, so uh, with Wonder, um, maybe I want to show the... Uh, New slides. So with Wonder, uh, we went about uh, developing a new language for the robots. And so we, our product here, as you see in the video, is a robot. Uh, and so when you're thinking about robots, it's helpful to get into the frame of mind of a robot. Um, I don't know if any of you have, have done that exercise where you try to create a program to teach someone how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. 
Um, when you think about it, making a peanut butter jelly sandwich is a very simple task, but uh, you have to be very explicit. So if you say, well, first you spread the peanut butter on the bread, um, there are several steps that you may have left out. For example, does the person need to take the top, the jar off the jar of peanut butter? Do they need to pick up the knife? So um, all of those little things uh, help explain to the robot or to the person in that case, uh, what to do. And when you're thinking about how to program a robot or what you want your program to do, it's a lot easier to put yourself into that frame of mind as if you are the robot. Uh, and so we didn't want to get caught up on uh, any syntax. Uh, so as Dylan was saying, so you know when you're using like whether you're using semicolons or colons, uh, none of that uh, comes into play. We wanted to keep it very visual. Um, so there, there are a lot of different visual programming languages, Scratch uh, and Scratch Junior being one of them. Um, and so we wanted to uh, take that concept of a visual programming language and uh, bring it into the realm of like uh, how a, uh, a robot would think about what it's about to do. And uh, in that, using what we call states. So for example, uh, at any given point in time, uh, if you are a robot or you're a running program, you are in a, in a given state, meaning that you are doing something. Uh, so like the little turtle from Logo, uh, when you give it a statement and say, move forward, that robot is thinking about moving forward and it's executing that command. And that's really all that it's thinking about. And then when it, when it finishes that, it, it waits until it starts to think about the next command. Now, how you go from, from state to state uh, is, is one thing that I'm going to talk about here. So um, here is a, a screenshot of Wonder. Uh, and so at the bottom of the screen, you can see there are a row of little icons. And those icons are all what we call states. Uh, and so we wanted to keep this very friendly and very uh, easy to, uh, very accessible for, for young kids. And so you kind of think of this as like, uh, kind of like your, your, your toy box. So if you have all of your toys down on the lower part of the screen, you can kind of drag them out of the toy box and put them in and you can start to play with it. And a similar way that you can link together, say like building blocks, you can link together the states of your program. And so, um, you know, the best time maybe now to share screen. I'm going to sh actually build one of these programs for you uh, live here. And so when that comes up, you will see the program environment. So this is our Wonder programming environment. Uh, and so I'm just going to, so you see we've got a, a couple different items here on the screen. Uh, we've got a familiar trash can. Uh, that is so you can clean up your, your workspace. I'm just going to drag this icon to the trash and get rid of it. Uh, up here, I have a, the name of my program. Uh, I have some controls here on the side. Uh, the most important thing is this button here that actually runs my program. Uh, and then this command here, this is the start of my program. So that's where my program begins. Uh, so when, when I'm writing a program for the robot, I always will start at the start. It's very simple. Uh, and then I can go down into my little tray of icons. And so I have a bunch of little things. They look like lights. And so it was very important to make the, the icons convey what they are about and what they're about to do. So I'm going to drag out a red light. And I can just drag it out. I can drop it anywhere. And then you notice on each of these, there's a little tail. And that tail is actually a link. And that's how I link uh, my, my, my program. So I'm just going to drag that from the start. Remember, we always start at the start. And then I drag that towards the first state. And so this right here, I just created a program. It's a very simple program. All it basically does is it will, when it runs, it will turn on the robot's lights to red. Uh, and uh, so in that sense, a couple different things are going on here. So first, I have a state here that is all about turning the lights red. And then I, and I have a link here that goes from the start of my program where the robot's doing nothing to the point where it's turning the lights red. Uh, and what's neat about this when we design this is, um, so there's a, there's a concept of, of, of flow when you're thinking about how a program runs. So your program will run through the different statements in your program. Here, we don't have written statements, but we do have the different states. And so we can think of the states uh, the flow of the program as running through the states in the same direction that I drag my finger. So I drag my finger from the start to the red, and I can also drag it from the red to the yellow. So when I run the program, 
that's the order that it will flow. I'll turn on my little robot here. And um, then I'm going to connect uh, to my robot just to illustrate this. Uh, so when I run this, you'll see it automatically flows through. It flows through the program, and it goes from red to yellow. And so this highlight shows that it's now in the yellow state. Now I'm going to stop this. Um, and so here, this state is all about just turning the, the lights yellow. Now, the same way that I can control the flow from, uh, from red to yellow, I can also control the flow uh, to another icon or even back uh, to the first icon. So I'm going to drag in another color of light. And I'm going to drag from yellow to green. And then I'm going to drag from green to red. And what's interesting about this is that here, I have made a loop on my screen. And if you're following the, the direction of my finger, it's going to flow from start to red to yellow to green and then back to red. And what's neat about that is that when you're, especially when you're working with, with children, uh, they can see the loop on screen. And then when it executes, they can see it executing in a loop. And so you can see the robot is changing its colors, uh, the colors of its ears, and they're going from red to yellow to green. And it's flowing in the direction that I created this program. And so the little icons here in between the states are shaped like arrows, and that helps to identify the flow of the program. Now, uh, so there we just illustrated a loop. And so uh, in the Python script um, that we saw earlier, we had a loop, and it was identified by the keyword while. Um, but here it's very visual, and, it's, and you can see it right away. Um, and so uh, some of the one of the reviewers that we we originally showed this program to said that this is this is like programming is like like it's like finger painting. Um, and it is kind of like that. You kind of drag your finger around and you create these icons. Now, this seems very simple, but you can also go uh, very deep. Um, so each one of these little links that links the states, uh, you can have multiples of these connecting uh, each of your states. So I'm just going to take one of these away, uh, take both of those away. And so now I have. Uh, two lights, uh, red, uh, yellow and a green, and I'm going to link this one, the red one, also to the yellow light. And here I'm going to click on this, and I'll explain what I just did there in a moment. But what's important to see is that from this red light, I have two options. I can go to the yellow light or I can go to the green light. And so what I did there is in a visual way, I just created a condition. And so this is a way of branching. So, uh, so based on what is happening and what I want to have happen with my program, I can either turn the light yellow or I can turn the light green. Now, what's neat is like this is very this this software. You can do uh, start off very simply, but you can go very deep. So each one of these states can have up to six different links coming off of it. So I can be so as I said, when you're thinking about your you're in the frame of mind of the robot. So if I'm the robot my light is red, and when my light is red, I'm thinking about what should I do next? And I can think about, I can respond to six different conditions. This little condition right here is saying, okay, if the top button on my head, so the robot has a little white button on the top of his head, and so that condition is waiting for a press of that button. Uh, this, this icon here uh, is the automatic icon. So basically it will automatically flow uh, to this light. So I'm going to change that and I'm going to point this to a, another button, one of, one of the orange buttons here. So now, depending on which button I press, it will either go to one of these lights. So if I run that, it goes red and now the robot is thinking like, okay, he's only thinking about button presses and he's thinking about if I'm going to press button one or I'm going to press the white button. Uh, so if I press the white button, it will turn green. And it'll do that. Now, if I had pressed the one button, he would have turned yellow. And so in that way, you can have your robot make decisions based on the input that it receives. And uh, as I said, you can have up to six different things that it's looking for in any given state. So as I go from the red state to the yellow state, for example, I can now look for six different things while I'm in the yellow state. Uh, and so you can make a very complex 
mesh of, of decisions in your program. And so you have a lot of power there, but you also can think about your program in a very simplistic way. You want to do one thing, and then when you're in that state, what are you thinking about and what are you looking for? And then when some one of those things happens, you go to the next state. And that's it. So you can kind of compartmentalize your decision making as you're you're building your program. Now, some of these commands. So we have a variety of commands here. Uh, obviously, our product is made for children, um, so we have a lot of fun things. So you can do a lot of light uh, play. You can also play around with the uh, the facial expressions on the robot. Uh, that's kind of fun. You can like make it have uh, smiley faces and things like that. Um, now, a lot of, uh, one of the things that we saw in the chat, some of the comments coming through with, with uh, language, and one of the problems you can have with language is understanding the tone. Um, now, robots, you don't necessarily, you don't always have to worry about tone, but um, because our robot uh, is a, a friendly character, uh, we do give you the opportunity to, to add tone. Um, so we have, you can play sounds through the robot. And what we did to make that simple is we divided the sounds up into different categories. So here I have uh, a brave category of sound, which are some brave sounds that I can, that I can make uh, when it's feeling confident. Uh, I also have um, some frustrated sounds and some, some happy sounds and some curious sounds. So a lot of different categories of sounds for, for each category. So if I want to be happy, I have a variety of things that I can make the robot say. And so I can kind of choose my tone for the robot uh, by choosing the different categories of commands. And so these are like uh, these are expressive commands. So these are sounds, but we also have uh, animations uh, and movement. And so movement, we actually took a lot of uh, lessons from uh, some of like the, the logo uh, that we saw earlier. So someone in the chat mentioned that they had worked with Lego software. Uh, I worked uh, on the original uh, Lego Mindstorm software um, uh, that we that was the robotics invention system. And with, when we were developing that software, uh, we took a lot of lessons uh, from Logo and, and Seymour Papert. And, and so and some of the instructions that you see, uh, that you saw in the previous slide, where the turtle would move forward, um, uh, I think it was 90, uh, uh, 50, uh, uh, pixels and then it would turn 90 degrees. Uh, we actually uh, borrowed from that here. So here we have a command that's called move to. And uh, again, now uh, with the with the the icons here, there uh, we use these icons. And once you understand the icons, you can you can use the software uh, pretty fluidly. Uh, I've had uh, students that that could not read use the software once they understand what the icons are. Now to go in and use the the, the full power of the software, we do have some text in the software, but we do have a uh, very simple uh, graphical uh, controls here. So in this case, move to means that the robot will move a specific distance and I can just slide this up to the distance that I want. So in this case, it's 25 uh, centimeters. And this little image over here shows you what the robot's gonna do. So he, it shows you the little arrow lights up and it's gonna move forward. Now I could drag this and I could say, I want you to move backwards. And there you see the arrow shows that it's gonna move backwards. But in a very simple way, I can give the robot instruction to move 30 centimeters forward. And then the same way that I linked up the lights before, I can link that up. And now that's a simple program that if I run it, the robot will start to move uh, 30 centimeters. And when it gets to that distance, it will automatically stop. And similarly, uh, there are other movement commands uh, so similar to the, the turtle program that we saw before, uh, we can uh, make the robot turn. So I'm just going to set it up to 90 degrees. The arrows show you the direction that it's going to turn. It's going to turn clockwise. And I'm going to link that up. And so you can see here, I'm going to have the robot. He's going to move forward 30 centimeters, and then he's going to turn uh, clockwise. Um, so I was, I was saying, so I, I'm going to just run that last program. So you'll see the robot move, and then uh, it will turn clockwise. Um, so those are some of the principles that we were trying to use when we were developing Wonder. Uh, we wanted it to be uh, easily understood when you're looking at the icons. 
uh, so that you can understand what the program is doing. Uh, but as you see, it's easy to create your program by dragging out the different icons. Here's a, another slide that shows an example of, of branching, uh, where we have uh, the robot doing two different commands based on different uh, conditions. Uh, and then you can also, because it is a graphical programming language, you can also illustrate the, the idea of what you're trying to program in the actual shape of your program. So here is a program that will make the robot move in a triangle pattern, and the actual program itself has been created to look like a triangle. Uh, we can also do more complicated things. So if you wanted to make a program that was about a rocket ship, you could actually build uh, your program to look like a rocket. Um, so this is kind of like a like a, a deeper level of of adding in uh, kind of uh, context to what you're what you're doing with your program. Um, but the at the core of it, we wanted to keep the language simple so that at the very uh, the at the basic level, you can sequence commands. At the next level, you can start to you can start to do loops. Uh, and then you can start to branch off. And once you start to branch off, as I said, each one of those individual states can have up to six different branches off of it. So you can actually start to create very complex uh, behaviors in your program, very simply, with just using a very few simple concepts. Yes. Cool. So it sounds like a bunch of people have been able to add their questions to the chat. And I think the EdWeb team has moved them over to the chat area, or to the questions area, excuse me. So we're going to go ahead and for the next um, remaining 10 minutes, take questions from the audience. And I'll just go ahead and open up the audience questions. When you get a chance to answer, are you all using your computer to create programs? I was under the impression that Wonder had to be used with a mobile device. OK, so great question, Erlika. Great question. Um, I can answer that. So um, we were actually using a prototype on the computer in order to, to actually screen share. Our apps for Dash and Dot are available for iOS devices, for Android, and for Kindle. Yes. For our middle school app, we actually are, for the first time, offering both a Windows 10 and a Chromebook app on top of our iOS and Android experiences. Um, and there is some sense that Chromebook might be coming soon, but that's something that we're, we're currently working on. Um, so great to hear that that's uh, feedback that you might have. Yes. Another question, uh, is it open source? Uh, the Wonder program is not open source. Um, uh, it is, it is uh, proprietary software. Uh, we are working on some APIs that you can use with the robot. Um, and uh, hopefully, we'll give you some updates when those come live. Next question from Denise is, are Dash puzzlets coming back? Uh, potentially. Um, still looking into whether we're going to be able to continue that. Um, but it's great to hear the feedback that you're interested in Dash puzzlets, and potentially it will come back. Is it possible to run it on a Linux machine? I do not believe so. We have not made that uh, compatible with Linux. Be curious to see why you're why you're hoping to run it on a Linux machine. I'd be interested to know what you're what you're up to, um, and whether that's the solution that you're looking for, or whether something else might work. Can it be used in middle school? Great question, Sue. So the the product that we demoed today, this was our programming language and our robot that's designed for younger learners, specifically for K through five. We actually do have a robot that's designed for middle school as well as software and programming languages that are designed for that age group to be developmentally appropriate um, for folks that are a little bit older. But the programming language that we showed you called Wonder, we actually have a more advanced, similar programming language called Create um, that's available right now for Q. And that kind of takes those different aspects of state machine programming, whether it's visualizing a loop, visualizing branching, and actually takes it to the next level by allowing additional things like parallelism, so being able to have different things happen at once. Like, for example, the robot can be programmed um, to, to synchronize its lights, its sounds, its head motion, and its wheel motion all at once, as well as being able to do robotic system design. So things like, how can the robot not just respond to sensing something in front of it or behind it and then continue on its way, but actually continuously sensing data from the sensors 
in front of it or behind it, and then having that map to output. So maybe as my hand gets closer and closer to the robot, it speeds up more and more. So being able to engage with those types, that type of learning at the middle school level. Please explain the difference between Q and dash. Okay, great, 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 great question. Uh, so here in the image you see the blue robot, that is dash. Uh, I do not have a Q with me. A Q uh, comes in two colors. It comes in quartz and onyx, a light and dark version. Um, so the differences between them, uh, there are some hardware differences inside. So uh, the sensors on Q are, uh, especially the proximity sensors, for example, are more advanced than on dash. So they're more sensitive and you can get some better data from that. Um, the core uh, differences between the robots comes from the programming experiences, uh, so that, as Dylan explained, uh, in our create environment, you can do some, some very, uh, some things similar to what you can do with Wonder, but you can also do uh, some parallel tasks, and you can get some of that dynamic feedback from the sensors there. So you can do some more advanced things with that. You also have, uh, someone in the chat mentioned earlier, um, uh, the, about uh, languages where you can have the visual and the, the text written code. Uh, and so we have another environment for Q uh, that we call code, which is a block-based uh, programming, but you can also flip that so you can switch it over and you can see the same program in JavaScript as well. Cool, so Tracy asked, before teaching coding to young learners, would drawing the programming language first on paper be a good approach? So that's a really interesting question. And we think if that's something that you're interested in doing with, with your students, it could, it could turn out well, for sure. Um, if you actually look at the curriculum that we've designed for our robots, a lot of the early lessons and many lessons that are sprinkled throughout interacting with the robots digitally through these programming languages are, are actually coupled with other unplugged lessons is what we call it and what code.org calls it. So oftentimes, it, yes, it can be really great to engage with these ideas of programming language constructs and different ways that you can interact with a robot or with a computer on paper? That's a great question. Yeah. Uh, does create only work with Q, not dash? Uh, that is correct. Uh, create uh, works with Q and not with dash. Uh, so dash works with wonder. Uh, and the, also there's there are some other applications that work with dash. Um, but create only works with, with Q. So I saw that Pris Priscilla from Pennsylvania asked if uh, Dash and Dot so or excuse me, does Swift work with Dash and Dot software? So there is a an app called Swift Playgrounds for the iPad, and there is different experiences with different hardware products, of which Dash is one. So you can actually use Swift code to program the robot through the Swift Playgrounds app. Um, unfortunately, right now it doesn't work with Dash and Dot; it only works with Dash. Um, but we would love to hear if that's something that you're interested in. Um, please, please email either of us and, and let us know that that's something that you're looking for. And I'm seeing Randy Porter says, I have found that offline coding with students as robots helps with the introduction of the coding language and highlights the need for clear instructions. Yes, so definitely being able to do, do that code, whether it's on paper or with, with different tangible elements outside of the, the device, really great point. I'm seeing a lot of other people are signing up and saying they agree too. Any other questions that you want to add to the chat? And of course, you can always feel free to email us. Both of our email addresses are on the bottom of the slide. Um, I'm Dylan at makewonder.com. Anthony is Anthony at makewonder.com. And if you want to check out any of the different things that we're doing at Wonder Workshop or see our products, you can go to makewonder.com. Um, specifically for educators, we have education.makewonder.com. And you can take a look at the different robots we have, as well as solutions for schools and curriculum um, that, that are available for both K through five and coming soon for middle school as well. Thank you so much for joining us. We really Thank appreciate you that you were here. Um, Ed Webb, it looks like they have a quick survey for you that you can fill out on your way out. And uh, we really appreciate your time. And be sure to email us if you have additional questions, and we'll, we'll definitely get back to you. Thanks, guys. That was fantastic. And thanks, everyone, for joining today. Again, to get your certificate for this ed webinar, if you're an EdWeb member, your personalized certificate will be posted to your homepage by the end of the next business day. If you've logged in with your email address, we'll email you links to a CE certificate form, the recording, and how to get added resources. 
You only need to take the quiz if you've dialed in by phone, if you're watching this as a group, or if you're viewing this as a recording. Join EdWeb to get personalized CE certificates and to access the EdWebinar archives with recordings, slides, chat logs, and more CE quizzes to earn more certificates. Please join us for the next Ed Webinar. That's June 14th, 2018. STEM horrific ways to avoid the summer learning loss. For an invitation, join the Coding and Robotics K-8 professional learning community on EdWeb, and uh, there's your link right there. And again, thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you to Wonder Workshop and to Anthony and Dylan. We invite you to join the community. It's free. You'll be able to access recordings of past webinars, download PDFs of slides and chat logs, and again, earn CE certificates by taking quizzes. And if you have any other questions you didn't have answered today, you can post them on our online discussion forums. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you next time.